Okay, I think we can start. Uh, Pedro, would you like to share your screen? Yeah, let me share my screen. One second. Yeah. So, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Today we're going to have Pedro Bernardinelli, which uh, who is a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania, and today he'll be talking about uh, solar system objects within the DS collaboration. So, thank you, Pedro. Uh, when you're ready. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, so, as Michelle said, my name is Pedro Bernardinelli. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania. And for those of you wondering, I am Brazilian. I got my undergrad at the University of Sao Paulo. So, you know, if you want to ask questions in Portuguese later on, you can. Uh, this work has been done in collaboration with my advisors, Gary Bernstein and Michelle Sacco as well, at UPenn, as well as David Gerdes and Ed Adams at the University of Michigan. So just to set the stage, <clears throat> uh, this is a view of the solar system. And I'm showing you the orbits of the major planets, Earth, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Uranus, Saturn, and Neptune, as well as Pluto. And I would like to draw attention to a few things in particular. First, Earth's orbit, which is shown here. The Earth is on average one AU away from the sun. And this is what this distance means, the distance between the Earth and the sun. Um, Neptune is usually 30 AU away from the sun. So it has a very circular orbit. So this distance is somewhat constant. And it's, of course, th this means 30 times further than the Earth. <clears throat> uh, now there's also Pluto shown in this image. And you can already see that Pluto's orbit is somewhat weird since it intersects with Neptune's orbit and is not concentric with the other ones uh, you see from the planets. Now, we also have a bunch of minor bodies, uh, in particular the asteroid belt, which is an innermost belt of small bodies with millions of asteroids, as well as the Kuiper belt, which is what I'm going to be talking about here. Uh, the Kuiper belt, I will occasionally use the term trans Neptunian region instead of Kuiper belt. And here I mean trans Neptunian to mean <clears throat> Anything whose orbit is uh, past Neptune most of the time. So let me remind you of how the two-body problem works and a little bit of classical mechanics that you probably haven't seen in a while. Uh, so if you have uh, a central force problem with uh, the sun or some other mass in the middle and you have a test particle, a bound orbit in the system can be described as an ellipse. And the ellipse has a bunch of <clears throat> parameters, which I'm going to be call, uh, using the term orthal parameters to describe them. Uh, in particular, we have the same major axis, which is the largest distance between uh, the ellipse and the center, or the mean distance between any given point and the focus of the orbit where the sun is. We have the eccentricity, which tells us how squished the orbit is. In other words, how much deviates from uh, a circular orbit. Uh, with these two coordinates, we can define the perihelion, which is the closest point that an object gets to the sun, and it's this equation right here. Uh, so just to define things a little bit more clear, uh, a circular orbit has E of zero, and I'm going to be talking about orbits with E less than one. So an orbit with E more than one is an unbound orbit. Um, we also have this angle called this eccentric anomaly, which tells how far along the orbit the object is, and we can construct this angle called the mean anomaly, which scales linearly with time uh, with these equation. And I'm going to use mean anomaly as a proxy for the position of the orbit. Uh, that was in two dimensional space. Now we have to place our orbit on the solar system. So if we pick a reference direction and a reference plane, for example, the reference plane can be the plane of the giant planets. We can then <clears throat> uh, further define some angles that localize the orbit in space. Uh, in particular, we have the argument of perihelion, which is a rotation that uh, towards the direction where the perihelion of the orbit points to. The inclination, which is how far from the ecliptic plane uh, the, object, the orbit is. So it's how much it deviates from a coplanar orbit, which is an inclination of zero degrees. And finally, the longitude of ascending nodes, which places the pole of the orbit in space. Uh, if you have an orbit with zero degrees inclination, it's convenient to define this longitude of perihelion angle, which is the sum of the longitude of ascending node and the argument of perihelion, since these two rotations are on the same axis on the orbit. <clears throat> and so these six uh, orbital parameters fully define the orbit. So this is the phase space, so we can do everything you can do with classical mechanics, in particular fully defining uh, the orbit along the two-body problem. All right. So the Kuiper belt was postulated in the 1950s by Edgeworth and Kuiper, and as a circular, circular flattened reservoir of bodies, 
uh, remnant from planetary formation. So these bodies are called planetesimals, which just means that they are a relic from the formation of the solar system. The idea is that they were looking for a place where comets came from. <clears throat> Since these would not have survived the four billion years of the age of the solar system, unless they spent their lives far away. So in other words, they were looking for a reservoir of comets. The first objects to be discovered in this region was Pluto in the 1930s. And this is an image of Pluto taken by the NASA New Horizons probe. And the second one was only discovered in 1982. It's an object called Albion. To give an idea of what these objects look like, we have both Pluto here, which is an example of what the largest Kuiper belt objects look like, and also Arakov, also called Jennifer TMU 69. Uh, the difference between these two is that Pluto has a diameter of over 2,000 kilometers, while Arakov is only 30 kilometers in diameter. So Arakov is a very good example of what a small body of the source system looks like. Uh, nowadays, we know of about 3,000 objects in this region. And one of the things that becomes immediately obvious once these objects became immediately obvious since these objects started being discovered is that there is a lot of surprising structure in the Kuiper belt. So here I'm showing you the same major axis, the eccentricity and the inclination of all objects we found with the Dark Energy Survey. And you can see <clears throat> that the transneptunian region is not just a pile of circular and coplanar orbits. Uh, for example, we have a bunch of non-circular orbits as indicated by their eccentricities larger than zero, as well as orbits that are not flat on the solar system, so their inclinations. This means that the standard theory of accretion of the solar system is not enough to explain uh, the transneptunian region and everything that goes on in this region. Also, more recently, there's this idea that the transneptunian region has some potential anisotropy. And the idea is that the most distant objects, they seem to be constrained in a certain region of the solar system pointing towards a direction, which led to the hypothesis that there is another giant planet on the solar system with about 10 Earth masses driving the alignment. For, re for reference, the rest of the Kuiper belt has about a few percent Earth masses. So this would be a huge effect of the system. This planet remains undetected. And one of the key ideas is that its orbit would be at about 400 U away. So it would be very hard to find. So now just to make things a bit more clear, uh, what we know about the transneptunian region is that it was shaped by major dynamical events in the history of the solar system. Uh, <clears throat> so there, the fact that the orbits are not just cold means that there's something perturbing the orbit. So either Neptune or planet nine or whatever else um, that is affecting the region. Uh, this comes from the fact that the planets didn't form in their current locations, but they rather migrated towards where they are now. And this migration transported objects from the inner region of the solar system into the Kuiper belt. Further instabilities in Neptune's orbit, coming from, for example, interactions between Neptune and the other giant planets, further excite the region and shape even more what we see today. And the interactions between these planetesimals and Neptune does place, places them on, onto dynamically hot orbits. <clears throat> And furthermore, we can have a ninth planet in the solar system further sculpting the region and giving what we see now. So to summarize, the transneptunian region has <clears throat> many families of objects with different formation histories as seen by, by their current dynamics and their current distinct surfaces. So how do we observe these objects and how we found the 3000 or so things uh, we, we, I mentioned earlier? So an object on the solar system moves significantly on the sky. This motion is a combination of both the motion of the object along its orbit, as well as the reflex motion from the Earth uh, itself moving. For a TNO, 500 seconds per hour is about a typical <clears throat> movement. Uh, this motion is very easy to distinguish if you have a dedicated service strategy. For example, here I'm showing you the discovery images of Albion, the first non Pluto KBO, and the first image taken about 9 p.m., the object is here. And after midnight, it has moved a substantial amount that you can even tell with your eye. <clears throat> so this is how we see these things. If you take images, uh, if you take a series of images on the same night, you can clearly spot the movement and it's easy to track down the object. Um, the motion of these objects has these loops, which have a period of one year because of course we're seeing the motion of the earth. So it's not a surprise <clears throat> that that's what they look like. And unlike all of, almost all areas of astronomy, we don't observe direct emitted light, but rather reflected light. And so our fluxes scale as distance to the fourth with, a, uh, with an area as well, which tells us how big the object is. And so the further you go, we have a very high dependence on distance to see uh, farther objects. 
uh, we tend to use this quantity called absolute magnitude, which is not what every other astronomer defines. And this absolute magnitude is the <clears throat> magnitude that the object would have if it was observed one AU away from the sun and one AU away from the observer. So this is pretty much a proxy for size since the size depends on a few other things as well. So, sorry, since the amount of light we see depends on a few other things. So to give you a better sense of motion, uh, this is the plane of the dark energy camera. I'm gonna talk more about that later on. And that's a video made by one of our collaborators. And in the lower right region, there is a, there's the date. So I'm gonna show you some of our objects <clears throat> uh, moving across the sky in our images. So uh, these objects were all found with the Dark Energy Survey. And for those of you who are not familiar with the project, uh, the DES covered 5,000 square degrees of the southern sky in five optical and near infrared bands uh, along six different observing years. And the DES also has a small high cadence area. Uh, uh, the DES is focused on a combined probe analysis of dark energy and dark matter by mapping the spatial distribution of hundreds of millions of galaxies and thousands of extensive parallel. In other words, the Diaz is not a solar system survey, it's rather a cosmology survey, which means that there are a bunch of unique features that uh, make our life harder, but also make our sample more uh, interesting. Uh, in particular, the Diaz has a lot of coverage outside the ecliptic plane, which is unlike almost all other solar system surveys. Because since all orbits cross the ecliptic plane at some point, you rather spend time there since you are guaranteed to find objects. Uh, the Diaz uses the dark energy camera. Uh, the DCAM has a three square degree field of view, 520 megapixels and across 62 different CCDs. It's shown here on the, on the right. On the wide field, uh, exposures were taken with 90 seconds in the GRIZ bands, the bands are defined below, and between 45 and 90 seconds in the wide band. Uh, the DS cadence explicitly avoids repeated imaging of the same field in short time intervals. And short here for me, for me means about one day. The idea is that if you spread your observations more evenly in, uh, over the observing year, you have a more homogeneous uh, mapping across weather and uh, any other fluctuations. So you have a better survey for the purposes of cosmology. This means that for solar system, this is a nightmare. And the results I'm going to talk about here focus on the first four years of data. So that's uh, 60,000 exposures, which is a lot of data. The DS data is exclusively well calibrated. The year four data was reduced with Gaia DR1 as a reference point, and <clears throat> which means that our astrometry is limited by, what, by Gaia DR1. So it doesn't have proper motion so, so far. We know astrometric distortions due to the telescope instruments and detectors to the three to six meter second regime, which means that our errors are dominated by atmospheric turbulence for bright objects. So the idea is that we can characterize these using a two point correlation function of astrometric errors on high signal to noise stars. So this is what I'm showing in the upper figure. And this function plateaus in a certain scale with where it has some coherent errors, which are due to the wind direction and whatever else is going on in the atmosphere. And by doing this, we get some error ellipses with which have an amplitude of between 10 to 15 million arc seconds. So this is our error budget for bright objects. Of course, for faint objects, we also have shot noise errors and, and magnitudes fainter than 23 magnitude in R band, we have about 100 million arc seconds of shot noise as well. Our photometry is also fantastic and it's uniform to six mega magnitudes over the wide field, which is a, a great achievement from the DS collaboration. This means that every object that comes out of DES is gonna have incredible astrometry and photometry. And so it's gonna be a very high quality detection. So how do we identify TNLs in DES and <clears throat> what are the steps that we have to achieve in order to do this? So, Because our exposures are far in time, from given spot on the sky are far in time, there is no immediate way to identify a thing that is moving. Uh, the idea is that we can tell whether two dots came from the same thing since 
whatever was moving there moved so far away that it's not obvious that it belongs to the same object. And so we have a three-step process that we have to follow. The first one is identification of transients. In other words, we have to find uh, potential moving sources in our data to which we can try to achieve orbits. Orbit linking, which is a process where we have a bunch of detections and we want to ask if they belong to the same uh, solar system object. And finally, we have to make sure that the things we found are real by doing some sort of orbit confirmation, which eliminates uh, false linkages. So the transient identification process uh, proceeds as follows. Uh, we have in the first four years of data, about 7 billion things detected in all of the DS images. And we have to tell what's moving there. Uh, what we do is we also have a catalog of some images where every image of a given spot in the sky taken in a single band is combined or stacked into one deeper image that is able to find fainter things. And so we get all of this data uh, from the single images and as well as the stacked images. And we do a positional matching algorithm of all sources in these, in these things. And what happens is that a moving source appears only once in a given spot in the sky over the four years of data. And also this moving source is either fainter or undetectable in the sent images. So here I'm showing you two examples coming from a single image and a stacked image. And the uh, cyan circles represent a moving object. So in the single image, it's clearly there. In the stacked, it disappears. Same thing in the other one. While a static source is there in the single image and is also there in some image with uh, you know, analyzed noisy way. Uh, this, so the idea here is that since you only have one detection of that thing, once you make the stacking, the signal is washed out by the noise of the other images, thus making uh, whatever was there uh, fainter or undetected. The primary source of contamination at this spot comes from asteroids. Since these are indistinguishable from TNOs in this stuff, there is no orbit information here. We're just finding things that are moving on the sky. So I like to think of this uh, process as a modern version of the blink operator using 1930 by Klein Tombaugh to discover Pluto. So this device was a way of shifting images taken from with a telescope in a way that someone could eyeball the motion. So these are the original discovery images for, from Pluto. So it's in spirit, it's the same process, except that we're not using this thing, we're using supercomputers to do the process. This is a map of the DS footprint in ecliptic coordinates. Uh, those of you who are part of the DS, you're probably not used to seeing the footprint in this way, but trust me that it's right. Uh, this black line here is the ecliptic plane. So this is where most of the things in the solar system are. And I'm also showing you the asteroid belt. Uh, the color of each dot represents how many transients we have on that exposure. And each dot, of course, represents where each exposure from DES was taken. In other words, this is a map of, den of transient density on the sky. This is only for bright objects, and bright here is being very loosely defined as R magnitude brighter than 23. And you can see that once we move away from the asteroid belt, the density drops from 200 transients per square degree to about 50 transients per square degree, which means that on the bright end, we're essentially asteroid limited, and there is no better way of doing of uh, doing uh, transit rejection that we are doing here. Um, to make this more precise, this is the average transit density versus ecliptic latitude for our data. And the left panel, I'm showing you once again the bright end. So this bright end is defined in a way such that uh, exposures, uh, most exposures are complete to so magnitudes fainter, sorry, brighter than uh, these detections, these magnitudes. And the dotted line in orange represents the density of the longitudinal density of the asteroid belt. And you can see that it might matches the data somewhat pretty well, which means that there is that once again we're doing the best job we possibly can on the bright. Uh, on the faint end, we have a constant background in our band of about 150 transients per square degree. There is no way we can uh, get rid of that since it would be a trade-off between completeness and background. So the higher our background. Also, the higher completeness, which is uh, a choice we have to make. The final transient catalog has 22 million detections. And now we can move from this process to trying to understand and find sources and objects. So, this is the process called orbit linking. And the question, question being asked here is which 10 or so detections among these 22 million 
belong to the same object. So once again, since this is a phase space with six dimensional, six, six dimensional phase space, we need to find triplet of infections. Since once we have those, we are in principle fully constraining the six parameters and can uh, recover the orbit. Uh, the problem is that doing this in the most naive way would require 22 million cubed operations, which is a very high number that no one wants to deal with. So we actually have to try harder than that. And so, other, otherwise, we would never be able to do this, solve this problem. So as I mentioned earlier, the motion on the sky of these objects is scaled by the distance to the object. In other words, the farther an object is, the less pronounced its motion is on the sky. So what we can do is we can bend in distance. So we guess where the object is going to be, and we do a series of steps that I'm going to describe in the next slide in order to find the orbit. Uh, what we get out of here is that we're reducing one of your freedom. We are constraining the distance because we decided that we wanted to, and this makes the process somewhat easier. So we find pairs by looking for things that have a motion consistent with a bound orbit at this nominal distance. So instead of just connecting the 22 million square uh, pairs that we would in principle form, we only connect 10 to the 12 pairs. This is still a very high number, but it's a lot more manageable than uh, over 10 to the 14. Uh, we find triplets then by assuming that this pair is moving with a bound orbit at that distance, which means that there is a possible range of paths that it could span in future times. For example, here, if you have a detection at day 10 and detection at day 20, diagram shows <clears throat> what is the range of possible orbits that could, that this, or, uh, sorry, the range of possible paths that this orbit could reach in day 60. And the zoomed version is what is the area that's spanned in the sky at a fixed date. Uh, this reduces the area significantly from just either randomly connecting triplets or doing, or connecting pairs, or doing pairs of, sorry, or connecting two pairs. Uh, this means that we gain by not having to check as many triplets as we would originally have to. Uh, this process produced 10 to the 11 triplets. It's still a very high number to do harbor fitting, but it's, it's possible, it, it was possible for us to reach this. Um, and so what happens is that once we find a triplet, most are coming from spurious alignments. So you have three random infections on the sky that look somewhat consistent with an orbit. And then you have to find, so to solve this, you have to find more detections along our other exposures. And the number of spurious alignments decreases strongly as a function of how many nights of detections we have. And, <clears throat> and it becomes incredibly rare once we go past six nights of detections. Uh, once we do that, we call, once we reach this point, we then call the orbit a candidate and save it for further confirmation. Our linking produced 424 candidates and of these 316 corresponded to real CNOs. So how do we go from these candidates to something we can reliably call Rio and part of the minor planet center and try to get a name or whatever? What we do is we've developed this technique called the sub-threshold significance. Uh, so we don't have only the six or so images that were used to discover the objects. The, object. uh, the orbit predicts that the object is going to be in many other images. However, due to water fluctuations, uh, flux variations in the orbit or sky brightness variations or whatever, the object was not detected in those images. However, there is some signal there. Uh, the object is hiding beneath the noise with a signal to noise of say two, and we need to find a way of uh, extracting this information. So this mosaic is showing both the detections and non-detections of a real TNO. And if you squint and look in the images with the blue crosshairs, you can sort of see that there is something there, but it, you can really be sure. So what we do is we stack all of these images. So assuming some nominal GRAZ colors, we can transform these series of images into one deeper image. If we use both the detections and non-detections, of course, you're going, to be, be, you're going to see a very strong dot, right? There's a very clear detection here. But if you use only the non-detections, and these images are statistically <clears throat> independent from the ones used to discover the object, if you see a signal, this means that there is actually something there. And this is what's happening in this case. We have a clear detection with a signal from OS 12, which is more than enough for us to call something a detection. In other words, 
we try to look for what's hiding beneath the noise in all of our images. On the other hand, if we don't have a real object, but really we have a linkage that uh, produces an orbit, if we do the same process, stacking all the images will give you some signal. But if you stack only the ones where you have a non-detection, uh, the output image doesn't have signal at all. So in this case, we have something with signal noise of zero, which means that this is not a real linkage and it's just some chance accident that seven points line up. And this eliminates completely uh, any chance of him having a false linkage since we are looking for an independent confirmation of the orbit. And finally, uh, we, our sample is only as good as our ability to understand it, and which means that we have to do some completeness testing and simulate uh, our survey. Uh, we've developed a technique that characterizes the probability of detecting a point source in any given DS image by comparing each exposure to this catalog that I mentioned earlier of <clears throat> uh, deeper images coming from a stack. Uh, and we, with this, we then have how likely we are to detect something in a given DS image. This is usually parameterized by a parameter we call M50, which is the magnitude of 50% completeness. And here I'm showing you a histogram of M50 over our GRSD Y mass. So remember when, when I said that we use R brighter than 23 magnitudes in order to call something complete? This is because R of 23 is the low end of our completeness distribution. And so it's a very precise term, uh, statistical term. Uh, given these magnitudes of completeness, as well as the DS pointing history, what we can do is that we can make ourselves a fake transient to an object, project that into the exposure, into the DS exposures, and try to see if, that, if that's something we would recover in our data. And the answer is that anything that is detected in more than six nights <clears throat> across two years of data is uh, recoverable which is great because then we don't have dependence on orbital parameters or magnitudes inside the footprint. Sorry, we don't have dependence on orbital parameters inside the footprints, only on magnitudes. Here I'm showing you a histogram of the expected number of detections uh, as a function of magnitude. And you can see that once we get towards the fainter end, the objects reach this gray area where they are not detected. By marginalizing over orbital parameters and all of the other things on the survey, we can then produce a magnitude of 50% completeness for the survey itself. And in the case of the year four data, this is 23.3. So we have an effective area of 5,000 square degrees at magnitude at completeness of 23.3 in our um, Now we can start talking about our sample of TNOs since we have made precise that we know what we're finding, that the objects are real, and we understand what we can find. So this is once again, a map of the DS footprint, but now each dot is showing you the location of detection of one of our transactinian objects. And the color is <clears throat> the, dis the distance the object was at discovery. Uh, there are a few features that become immediately obvious here. Uh, the first one is that there are no detections at high ecliptic latitudes. You don't see anything past 60 degrees latitude which is once again, an indication that there is some, still some flatness on the Kuiper belt, even though uh, we have dynamically hot orbits. The second one is that there are very few detections past 55 AU. You can also see this on the second uh, diagram, which is discovery distance versus absolute magnitude. And you can see that we do have sensitivity for things for their distances, we're just not finding them. And this is an indication that the protoplanetary disk from which the solar system was born was truncated at about 50 years, since the bulk of things we find are at those distances. Um, one other thing is that most objects are very close to the detection threshold. So this is the magnitude of 50% completeness line in H and distance space. <clears throat> and this means that anything we can do to increase our magnitude of 50% completeness is desirable because this means that we're gonna find many more objects. Uh, the size distribution on the Kuiper belt is a power law. And so there's a huge gain in increasing the magnitude of 50% completeness. And once again, uh, we use absolute magnitude as a proxy for size, since uh, the size and the albedo are degenerate in how bright we see an object. 
So let me come back again to this plot and start going a bit deeper into the different features we have in our paper. Uh, first of all, these uh, thin dotted lines are lines of constant perihelion. And in particular here is 30 AU where Neptune is. And I'm gonna start talking about the different dynamical classes we have in our data section. Uh, first, let's start with the classical TNOs. Uh, here I am showing you an example of an orbit of a code classical TNO and also Neptune's orbit for comparison. And I'll be keeping these uh, standards up in the next few slides. So the classical TNOs subdivide themselves in two different populations. The first ones are the low inclination, also called dynamically code population. So these are objects that form in situ four billion years ago, and thus they are primordial objects. They have somewhat circular low inclination orbits. This is what you would expect from uh, the standard accretion theory. And this region is denoted by the blue box here. The Arakoff object that I showed you earlier, the one with the two, uh, balls with 30 kilometers of diameter is an example of a code classical. There's also high inclination population also called dynamically hot population that was implanted into the Kuiper belt by Neptune during its migration. And so they formed closer to the sun than where they are now, but Neptune placed them in the region they currently are. Now, we have the scattering objects. So these are objects that have, that have interacted with Neptune since the beginning of the solar system or are actively interacting with it. So these are dynamically excited orbits. They have high inclinations and high eccentricities and they're also unstable for long, long periods of time. Uh, in particular, uh, the scanner disk is the source of comets that uh, Edgeworth and Kuiper were looking for in the 1950s. So that's where uh, the comets they wanted to find came from. Now we have the resonant transneptunian objects. And you've probably noticed that we have these <clears throat> vertical lines in both figures. Uh, these denote the location of a mean motion resonance between an orbit and Neptune. So the idea is that uh, as Neptune migrates, it traps objects into these orbits, sorry, into its resonances and places them in their current orbits. And the idea is that a mean motion resonance means that there's an integer ratio between the period of an orbit and Neptune. And these orbits are protected from close encounters of Neptune over longer periods of time. In other words, they can stay there for uh, the age of the solar system. Uh, an example of one of these objects is Pluto. Pluto is at the three by two resonance at 39.7 AU. And <clears throat> that's why Pluto can cross Neptune's orbit and still survive. And the size of the population at these different resonances is an indication of the migration speeds and uh, smoothness of Neptune. In other words, there's a lot of information out of the source system we can get from studying these resonances in detail. Uh, now we have the detached objects. Uh, this is the class with the highest perihelion orbits and they're also stable. So they have high semi-major axis and higher perihelia, which means that they don't have interactions with Neptune or they have very small interactions compared to the scattered watches. And the idea is that these were possibly previously scattered, but they are no longer under Neptune's influence. And while this is a good mechanism for understanding some of these objects, their complete formation mechanism still remains unclear. So we can produce all of them in our current knowledge of sources. A subclass of these, of both the scattered and the detached objects are the extreme TNOs. So these are the ones on the most distant and most eccentric orbits. And you can see that up to now, we had things only on the left side of the figure. Now we have things on the right side of the figure. <clears throat> and these objects have a completely unclear origin. And since they are dynamically decoupled from Neptune, they are the ones that can potentially be perturbed by a ninth planet. So let me remind you once again of orbital elements. And in particular, I want you to have the argument of perihelion, the longitude of node, and the longitude of perihelion in mind. In 2014, it was noted by Thrill and Shepard that all objects with semi-major axis larger than 50 AU and also perihelion larger than 30 AU were clustered around argument of perihelion of zero degrees. So in this figure, you see that once you go past a certain distance, you stop seeing objects all over the place and they only stay in this uh, somewhat narrow region. A further argument in 2016 by Batigan and Brown pointed out that besides this argument of perihelion clustering, all objects with same major axis larger than 250 AU were also clustered in the longitude of ascending node and longitude of perihelion. 
So what this means is that these orbits are physically aligned. So this is what's being shown here in the figure. You can see that there's a bunch of orbits and they're only in one given region of the sky. And similarly, <clears throat> you don't see objects at all angles as you would expect from having a uniform underlying population. So it was hypothesized that there is a ninth planet in the solar system that is confining these angles over the billions of years time scales we're talking about and stabilizes them and keeps them in their place. There are, of course, alternative explanations to this phenomena. Uh, the first one is that we have an observational bias and there is no real clustering <clears throat> and it's just an apparent effect due to observational biases of different surveys. And while this is a somewhat boring explanation compared to having a ninth planet, uh, it means that we had just have to try harder uh, to do our statistics. And the other explanation is that there is a soft gravity on the distant Kuiper belt, which means that inclinations are unstable for billions of years, which leads both to an argument of perihelion clustering and a longitude of perihelion clustering. I won't be talking about this uh, second phenomenon here, but just keep in mind that this also exists. And of course, uh, since 2017, people, sorry, since 2016, people have tried to measure these. So I'm gonna review a little bit uh, the three main measurements uh, of this clustering so far. Uh, the first one is the one by Ossos. So Ossos is a very traditional TNL survey. They covered 155 square degrees to magnitudes greater than 25 in our band, which means that while they don't find things all over the place like we do, they're able to find much fainter things and they have a sample of over 800 objects. The Ossos is also very well characterized. And so with their sample of nine objects in Benister L18 and eight in Shankman L17, they were able to demonstrate that there is no clustering at all in their data using a fully biased information. Uh, through Hill and Shepard, they are keeping their survey where they try to find the most distant objects from the solar system. And <clears throat> uh, with a sample of four very distant objects, they do see some clustering in the of perihelion in the face of selection effects, but they also have very complicated observational biases. The idea is that their survey only tracks the most distant objects. So they are naturally <clears throat> selecting things in a somewhat known standard way. And also their effect is not strong. It's, uh, it's a two sigma effect. So it's not something very uh, conclusive yet. Finally, there is the minor planet center sample analysis by Brown and Matigi. So this is an analysis on public data that has 14 objects and only a 0.2% chance of accidental clustering. Note that this uses public data. So it doesn't have the information from each survey selection function. So it's in nature, a very incomplete analysis. An analysis that only uses what people choose to report, which is very often not everything that they have. So what can DES bring to the table then in this discussion? <clears throat> uh, we do have a sample of seven objects in the most liberal Etienne definition, the one with same major axis larger than 150 AU and perihelia larger than 30 AU. Uh, we have a sample of four objects in the more restrictive case with same major axis larger than 250 AU, the one where Batting and Brown pointed that it was a nodal clustering. Uh, if we make a higher perihelion cut, for example, at 3070 AU, we then eliminate objects that have potential strong interactions with Neptune. And so we have four objects in the liberal 150 U case. And note that these four objects are not the same as the ones in the previous case. And finally, if we impose both restrictions, we have a sample of three objects. It's not a big number, but it's something we can try to do some statistics on. So here in these figures, I'm showing you those orbits, as well as the DS footprint in ecliptic coordinates. And you can see that once we move outside from the ecliptic plane, we have a much wider footprint. And in the zoomed in, region, um, I'm showing you the locations of detections of each one of these objects marked by stars, as well as their perihelion marked by circles, and also where Neptune is. And, <clears throat> and one thing you should notice here is that all of our, all of our objects are detected very close to perihelion. Uh, this shouldn't be a surprise because this just comes from the fact that uh, we can only see objects when they're closest. Once again, our fluxes go as distance to the minus four, so this is not a surprise at all for us. Uh, we then proceeded to construct our selection functions. And the idea is that we have an isotropic ensemble of extreme TNOs made by cloning each one of our detected objects uh, with an uniform distribution in longitude of node, argument of perihelion, and anomaly. 
And we normalize the distributions in a way that they represent a precise match to data in uh, the order of four parameters, A, I, and H. And by simulating this, then we have our selection functions and I'm showing them here in the figures. This is our Oxford of Perihelion, Oxford of Node, and argument of Perihelion selection functions for the four different study cases that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and these vertical lines show you the location where each object was detected on. So with this in hand, we can start asking ourselves whether the two distributions agree. And we did this by <clears throat> using Kuiper's test. Uh, this is a variant of the more common Kolmogorov Smirnov test that is particularly useful when you have a sample that is invariant under cyclic permutations. In other words, if you're working with angles, you want to use Kuiper's test. And this test shows no significant disagreement between an isotropic ensemble and the observed populations. In particular, I'm showing you here the p-values and I want to draw attention to two different cases. The first one, our lowest p-value, which is the one of 0.02 in case four in one of note. Uh, and you would think, well, this is a somewhat low p-value, it's lower than 0.05. So maybe you do have a signal there and you're just misinterpreting your data. But remember that we applied 12 different tests to, uh, the, to effectively the same data set, which means that our tests are very correlated well, with each other. <clears throat> and if we assume that they're all correlated, this means that this actually, they have a chance of 25% of doing this. It's, so it's not a p-value of 0 0.02, but an effective p-value of 0 0.25. In other words, there is no signal at all. Uh, also the most physically interesting case, which is the one on the launch of the perihelion and on the most distant and uh, decoupled from Neptune population, we have a p-value of 0 0.11. And this means, once again, that there is no st strong signal in our data. We also ask, asked ourselves, what is the likelihood of detecting each one of our objects given the isotropic sample? And the conclusion here is that our objects are not particularly rare. They all come from regions of high detection probabilities. And this can be easily seen in this figure, right? Uh, the objects are all in the regions where the selection function is highest. So we are only finding what we can find. Our objects are not <clears throat> uh, not particularly, in, they're not coming from particularly interesting regions of uh, detection. So this, this also shows that there is no further deviation from isotropy. So the conclusion here is that our data does not require the point nine hypothesis. In other words, we can explain our, some, our apparent clustering of extreme terms to objects by just saying that this is a uh, service selection factor. One important thing to note, notice here is that this does not invalidate the point nine hypothesis. To do so, we would need to <clears throat> have a complete set of simulations that all scenarios with a point nine is ruled out by data. So this is a much simpler task, just saying that the simplest case is not uh, compatible with point nine. Uh, right now, we are going through the full DS data set. Uh, this is a search on all six years of data, <clears throat> which means that we're searching 80,000 images from the sky for objects. We have improved our detection pipelines in a way that our catalogs from each image have a 0.4 magnitude gain in completeness. In other words, we're getting a lot more data for free just by, uh, make, just by having better detection algorithms. Uh, the price we pay from doing this is that there's a substantial increase in the transient catalog. We have 110 million transients instead of the 22 million we had previously. This means that we have to try a lot harder to find things. For example, we have improved substantially our linking algorithms in a way that we can handle this uh, big data flow. And also we're using tools borrowed from our friends from big data analysis <clears throat> to do things better. Um, and we're gonna have to rely much more strongly on the subtraction significance technique that I talked about earlier. Uh, the good news though, is that the entire search is expected to have a 0.6 magnitude increase in completeness. And so we had a 23.3 <clears throat> magnitude completeness in uh, year four. Now we have 23.9 and assuming a, a parallel luminosity function from the Kuiper belt means that we expect twice as many objects in Y6. And this is fantastic. This brings Diaz as one of the best sources and surveys to date for transaccionate objects. We're also doing a very detailed characterization of observational biases, where we are keeping track of things, of our detection efficiencies at every given stage. And also we have a very realistic population <clears throat> of objects underneath. For example, we can test our completeness versus light curves or colors 
and thus have a full understanding of what we can and can So just to summarize, uh, TNOs probe the different dynamical effects in the history of the solar system. Finding TNOs with the dark energy survey is a very challenging but completely feasible process. We just have to build tools that can handle our data. Uh, the Diaz data so far does not require the planetary hypothesis. So it's the second survey to have a no answer regarding this theory. And finally, the year six search has the potential to double the object sample. Thank you and I'll take the questions. Thank you very much, Pedro. So uh, questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, Pedro. It's Julio here. Hi, Julio. Hi, hi, Pedro. Okay, let me let me just uh, turn on my camera. Okay, so uh, just taking a look at the list of the attendance. Okay, I'm going to, to to ask you in English. I don't know if my microphone is good <laughs> because my sometimes once I heard myself speaking in in English in a recording and I could not understand myself. So I, I suppose my, my, my microphone is not very good. So uh, my questions are, uh, okay, you say that the uh, DAS data does not require the plan, uh, Planet 9 hypothesis and they showed a number of, of studies on this, but in your opinion, the clustering, a, a, a clustering, is it real or not? Or it's not possible to, to properly answer that for the time being? Yeah, this is a very dicey question. And my answer so far is that I don't think it's real, but I'm open to being wrong. So once we find more of these objects and with other surveys coming, such as uh, the LSST, we'll be able to make a more firm statement on this. Uh, so far, I think that there is no evidence for the clustering and people have to do better statistics with their data. But you know, with the year six uh, Diaz analysis, we might, I might change that answer. Okay. okay. Uh, could, could you please go back to to his slides, please? Yeah, let me try oh, my keynote. Uh, okay. This one or the following? Uh, no, no, no. Sorry. The, the, yes, yes. This one. This one is okay. good. It's, uh, uh, here in, in the bottom, the uh, bottom left part of the, of the slide, you are saying that you have a, a 50% of detecting uh, objects with magnitude 23.3. Yeah. Is that it? okay? So, but this uh, this kind of detection is obtained from uh, the verification or the efforts you showed before by, let's say, co-adding images or not. Yeah, so, this, if you directly on the single epoch images, I I'm asking that because I, I think it was uh, when uh, Martin was working with the DAS data for TNOs, it was not all that easy to. to to, to detect in single images directly. Uh, yeah, so, 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 the, so the idea is that uh, with a magnitude of 23.3 in our band, we expect to have about six detections of such an object in all of our, uh, all of our exposures. So the single epoch information is actually shown in this figure. And uh, the 50% completeness for our band peaks at about 23.5. So we do expect to see things in, uh, in this region, but of course, right, uh, there are weather variations and we can lose objects to at this case. So this 23.3 so this figure comes from a full simulation of the year four data. Uh, for any given image, it's, uh, it's a bit harder to answer whether an object can be found or not. Okay. So it just, means, my, uh, my, it just means that we have six chances of seeing an object uh, okay. at such magnitudes. Great. And uh, well, my, my last question is, do, uh, could you quantify the, uh, the fraction of tracklets that, that we're left without, uh, let's say, any further uh, real identification with an object? Yeah. Uh, uh, that could be a, a very nice work to try to recover it with perhaps... Uh, uh, other surveys as it was uh, once already pro uh, proposed by, uh, by David Woods. Yeah, so what happens is that uh, we do lose some objects, especially in this region uh, of the footprint. This is 
where the Kupsi Plain is. And unfortunately, it also happens to be one of the most narrow regions of the DS. So what happens is that uh, objects move outside the footprint. So in some cases, we have uh, even eight, eight or 10 attractions in one year, but they're not able to place a very <clears throat> strong constraint on the orbit here just because the thing moved out of the footprint, right? So I think that this is a minority effect. Uh, this is also shown a bit here uh, where we do have some things at magnitude 22 that don't have, 10, they don't have six attachments in all of our uh, data. So it's a minor fraction of the data, but it, it's something that exists. Okay. Great, thanks Thank a you. lot. All right, Hello. any more questions? Yes. Yeah. Hello, Pedro. Thank you very much for a great talk. That was a very good webinar. Um, my question is, um, well, I'm Felipe Braga Hibas, okay? So my question is, you're you talking about the truncation on the Kuiper belt? Yeah. I may, oh, I can also turn on my, my camera. Let's see. Well, yeah, exactly, on these slides. So, um, you, you said that there is this truncation that's about uh, something, I mean, uh, that you are not seeing objects from mm -hmm. uh, further than 55 AU. But does that mean that we, we are not seeing uh, big objects further than that? that what that about is... the small ones? Uh, wouldn't they be the ones that wouldn't uh, be mostly perturbed during the, the migration? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I didn't make a very precise statement here. And the answer is yes, we're only seeing, so we, we don't have a very strong sensitivity for very small objects past 55 AU, right? Because of course, once again, they go as the, sort of the amount of flux received goes as the yeah. dwarf, so it's harder to find things there. Um, on the other hand, since we have a lot of area, we would expect to see things if they were there, even at uh, H, of five, right? So in this figure, uh, we something with an age of 5.5 would still be detectable at 60 AU. So we do have some sensitivity there. It's of course limited by uh, the number of big objects. Uh, of course, we're not the only survey to try these. There were uh, a number of pencil beam surveys that were able to reach magnitudes fainter than 27, for example, that also have no detections at these distances. So. It's not like we're the first ones to say this. It's okay. Uh, yeah, because when you also when you showed the, that plot with the the positions of the objects that we detected uh, uh, with respect to the, the their orbits, so oh. they are all in the perihelion. So you are not seeing any object further than that. Yeah, objects that would be at not not necessarily at the perihelion, but uh, far uh, not yeah, necessarily at the yeah. aphelion, but. Yeah, further away. So then we, we would show objects that had different uh, alignments uh, of their arguments. Mm -hmm. So then we would maybe say that the clustering is not real uh, and, and you are not seeing nothing, right? So, uh, well, I think that the next question would be, do you think that LSST will, will answer this question? <laughs> I think so. I mean, LSST is going to have the entire southern hemisphere, right? So uh, what me what this means here is that you are no longer limited by the region of the sky you point to, and yeah. you can and if objects are isotropically distributed, they will be isotropically distributed in LSST. Even though you only see the closer objects, if they are everywhere in the sky, you're going to see them. Mm. And the other surveys uh, didn't they uh, uh, look at for the other angles, like from ninety to to uh, 270, yeah, so they so, wouldn't have found the, the, those objects that are in perihelion? Uh, so the idea is that these biases, because of the eccentricity of the orbits are very complicated and not easy to understand. So there is this great paper by Schenkman et al, which analyzes the OSSOS um, selection effects. So here, these shaded regions are where OSSOS pointed to, sorry, the, these regions are where OSSOS pointed to, this is the vector plane. Um, okay. And, and so they, they, the same thing as the yes, right? They only found their objects uh, where they were looking mm -hmm. and where they reached Perry Higgins when they were looking. Okay. And so uh, 
I think the only way out of this problem is with LSST. To go back to your previous question, uh, if you if you have a limited area of the sky, you're going to have some selection points. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you have a big enough number of objects, anything that doesn't match your selection function exactly will become measurable. So, for example, uh, with DES, if we have if we had ten times more ETNOs, we would be able to rule out a selection effect, even though we have a narrow region of the sky. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you once again. Thank you for the great talk. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Um, then I have one. So, Pedro, uh, you showed that um, at some points you have like uh, 10 to 11 uh, triplets. And we go back to that slide. Yeah. Yes, there. And then when you go to candidates, you go to like 400. And one of the main reasons is that because you require to have like at least six images, right? Yeah. So we make a requirement uh, of six images in multiple years. So it's a lot less likely that you have something happening by accident uh, that still looks like a real orbit. But sorry, I, right. I cut your question. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, do you have uh, an estimative of um, if you could go to a lower threshold of images of uh, how many more objects you could recover? Yeah, that, that is a great question. So I consider going to fives uh, instead of sixes. And what happens is that we start having uh, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of possible linkages that do look like a real orbit. Uh, the other thing that happens once you go down to fives is that the quality of our orbit decreases somewhat, which means that this technique of trying to find the known detections also becomes harder because then the orbit is not well characterized. And this only works because with six detections, we effectively know to the precision of one pixel where the thing is going to be in the max field images. And so it's a lot harder to go down to fives. Uh, with the year six data, we are going to face this problem with sixes uh, because we have 110 million transients, which means that the chance of having something by accident is a lot higher. It's about five times higher. And so going to fives would be borderline impossible with uh, the year six data. But yeah, that's that's a great question. Uh, Shell, I, I, have a quick, I have a quick yes. question. Hi, Pedro. Uh, yeah, sure. Have you seen the recent work from Mario Uric? about these linkage things, they, were, they looked very promising. Yeah, so uh, his idea is based on the Hugo link package by Matt Holman, if I understand it correctly. And it's, it's actually very similar to our, um, to our ideas as well. And if I understand it correctly, what they do is they remap the entire uh, parameter space into a 3D view with a given distance bin as well. So it's, it works very similar, similarly to our lecture. Okay, I just wanted to give you a heads up. We we actually he gave us a presentation. And it was very interesting too. Okay. No, that's good. I should. Uh, it, it's on the website, right? So I should watch that at some point. <laughs> okay, it's there. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. Just a um, quick, right. quick question. question. Yes. Yeah, a quick question uh, uh, about the, the detecting limits. Uh, the, about the non-detection actually. Uh, or, what is a known detection? Because uh, let's say uh, when you do uh, uh, align them, you have a, a signal, but so it, uh, what is the, the cut limit? Yeah, so that's great. Uh, so what happens is that uh, when we run the DS detection pipeline on these images, the, the catalogs don't have anything, for example, in this position. So if you squint your eyes, you can probably see that there's a black dot there, right? But uh, whatever we're doing yes. with the catalog says that there's nothing there. So for the Diaz year four data, I think the detection limit is about signal to noise of 10, which means that most things are complete to so the signal to noise. And you start losing things at signal to noise of five, which is probably why you can see this thing for I. On the year six data, uh, signal to noise of three is the detection limit. So 
if you have a very small signal, you can get it. But if you have things a signal size of two, they're not going to be there. And the only way to extract this information is by stacking in the same way we did here. Okay, thanks. Anyone right. else? Any more questions? Right, so uh, then I guess I'll go again. Uh, I have a follow up question uh, on this, specifically on, on uh, this method you're using. So uh, let me see if I understood correctly. Yeah. What you do is um, once you you have an idea of uh, what's the orbit of the object, then you go to the images and you look where you expect the object to be, right? Yeah. Uh, but, um, how, uh, how how do you account for like uh, some uncertainties on, on the orbits that you could have? And like, how, how do you make sure that you're accounting for, for instance, if you miscenter the, the detection, for instance? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So this is once again, where the Diaz astrometry shines. And since we know our astrometry to the 15 mega second precision level, uh, this means that our predictions of the position of the object here are going to be less than the size of the PSF. So even though if we do have some misalignment in the images, and you can probably see that here, this is not really a black dot PSF as you would expect, right? So it does have some uh, ellipticity to it. So, and even though we're doing this, we one, make sure PSF for the signal generalized computation is big enough that it accounts for the signal being spread in a, in a different way. And we also know our orbits to a precision where we are effectively only a pixel away from things. So it doesn't matter that much. But this just means that we have fantastic orbits. This wouldn't work if we had one arc second precision in our orbits. Oh, I see. Interesting, really interesting. Okay, any more questions? All right, so, wow, thank you very much, Pedro, for coming. Thank you. It was a, a wonderful yeah. seminar. Uh, if and, anyone uh, thank you for everyone. Yeah. Right, yeah, thank you. So uh, everyone, thank you for coming. And this webinar will be Actually, it is already available on YouTube if you want to rewatch it. It's also on our website. And I'll see you all next week then. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye bye.